Here's the last video for marine biology, and we'll just get going on it. Adaptations for long dives in whales, the lung size and clearing, blood cell size, and concentration. So looking at the lung size of whales, they have, of course, they're larger creatures, so they have larger lungs. And if you remember, we blew up these little balloons. Um, they have the ability to clear about 90% of their air. Meaning they can, they, every breath they take on a normal basis, they get rid of 90% of what's inside their lungs. Versus us, I think we have about 20%. Their blood cell size, of course, is larger, which can hold more hemoglobin. And their concentration, they have more red blood cells um, per milliliter. So they have more blood, concentrated blood, larger red blood cells, more hemoglobin, larger lungs. All this accounts to they have, can do these really long dives. Function of delayed implantation. You remember this is taking place in pinnipeds such as seals and sea lions. They have a seven month gestation period. And again, that's the period that they hold their young. And they also have a five month delayed implantation. What that means is that um, after mating, the embryo delays the implantation on the side of the uterus for five months. And then once it does, it has a seven month gestation, therefore it's born one year later. High wave energy and low wave energy with the particle size. So high wave energy, you will have rocky coasts and you can also have sand. Low wave energy, will be your silt and your clay. So your bays and estuaries will have these small mud-like particles. Remember, silt and clay together make mud. Positives and negatives, I'm clamping down for snails in the inner tidal. So um, one of the positives um, is that they're going to um, have less desiccation. So they'll have less desiccation or less drying. Okay, um, they also could have protection from uh, from predators. Because they are clamped down, it's harder to get them off. The negatives of clamping down is going to be they can't eat because these are um, snails and they use their scraping tongue to scrape off the algae off the rocks. So if they're not moving, they're not eating. So this clamping down is um, a contraction, their foot contracts. Biotic factors and abiotic factors. Let's call biotic factors B. Those are the biological. And the abiotic factors, these are going to be the environmental. So desiccation, as we said, drying out. Desiccation is going to be an in environmental, so abiotic. Competition, creature versus creature, that's biotic. Predation, creature versus creature, biotic. Rain, that's environmental, abiotic. Temperature, abiotic. Okay, keystone predators. 
um, sea stars and otters, and these are the key to diversity. So <coughs> um, the sea stars, if you remember, these are going to be eating the mussels, and it prevents the mussels from taking over. So it eats the mussels, and it provides a clearing for um, other creatures. Makes a clearing for others. So it enables others to survive. If you remember the otters, the otters eat the urchins. And because they do that, the otter population drops and it increases the kelp beds for fish. So in both cases, um, they increase the number of types of creatures, the diversity of the creatures that can live there. Creatures that have filter, suspension, deposit, feeders, and where they would live. Uh, filter feeders are going to be in lower energy environments, such as clams, sponges down in the bottom of the ocean, the benthic zone. So filter feeders, these are going to be low energy environments. Suspension feeders, they need to capture particles in the water. And some of them, like um, copepods, um, they will be in the open water. Um, but those that are attached, like, like barnacles, those are the um, upside down um, crabs that have the uh, little uh, fingers that can reach out and they can grab pieces of, of food. Oops. That was another video on another device going off. So suspension feeders is, is both. Um, these can be open water, like copepods. Or they could also be um, high energy intertidal. High energy intertidal such as your uh, barnacles. <laughs> Deposit feeders, these guys are going to be um, bottom feeders. So they'll be eating the mud or the sand. So you won't find them in the intertidal. You won't find them in the open ocean. So they each have their own environments. Bottom feeders, open water, high energy, and typically low energy. The amount of disturbances promotes the most diversity and why. So this is the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. So we have a medium. If there's too little disturbances, then the dominant species takes over. If there's too much disturbance, then nothing can get established. Everything dies. Well, not everything, but most creatures will die. Both cases, you'll have little diversity, but if you have a medium disturbance, it will um, prevent the dominant species from taking over, and um, it'll be more of a stable environment. Okay, points versus bays with sediment and wave energy. So points, these are going to be high energy environments. Points are going to be um, where the land meets the ocean in the most um, strong way. So you have a point coming here. You have lots of wave energy, high energy environments. So points are high energy 
And again, they typically are rocky. Okay, rock, and you also get some sand there. And of course, the bays, this is going back to the previous high wave energy, low wave energy with particle size. Your bays are typically your low energy, your points are gonna be your high energy. So you have low energy with your sand and silt. Immersion versus immersion. Immersion means you're immersed. You are in the water. Immersion means you're being exposed. Okay, so with temperature fluctuations, there's less temperature fluctuations when you're in the water. You're gonna have more temperature fluctuations. You're gonna have more desiccation. And wave energy, you're gonna have more versus immersion, you're underwater. So immersion means you're gonna be in the inner tidal zone. So you're gonna be exposed for parts of times, other times you'll be covered with water. Under the water, you're gonna have um, less temperature fluctuations, you won't have loss of water, and your wave energy is gonna be a lot less. Location of rocky intertidal versus sandy intertidal in North America. The rocky intertidal, this is usually with our active margins. And those are located on the west coast. The sandy intertidal in North America, these are your passive margins. And typified on the East Coast. Now that doesn't mean that we do not have sandy coasts on our coast, because we do. It doesn't mean that the East Coast is lacking in um, rocky intertidal, because they do have some up in the Massachusetts area, but these are just general characteristics. Adaptations of seaweeds for the rocky intertidal. They have strong holdfasts, like the pastelsia, they have strong hold fasts to attach to the rocks. They also have flexible stipes so they can bend back and forth. They'll bend with the wave activity. Definition of sessile. Sessile creatures are attached, they're typically non-moving creatures, like mussels, barnacles, sponges. What an anoxic layer is, if you remember the anoxic layer, this is without oxygen. This was that black smelly layer Black layer without oxygen, and it smells. Who produces it? It's gonna be bacteria, because in the absence of oxygen, they're gonna use sulfur, and they can create this compound. Instead of H2O, burning the sugar like we would, they produce H2S, and that's hydrogen sulfide, and this is what really smells. Okay, humpback whale feeding. This is, um, they make a spiral bubble curtain. Many creatures use this technique, but this is how humpbacks feed. Then they swallow all the water at the top when those creatures are nice and condensed, and then they filter with baleen. Oops, baleen. 
filtering. Reason for pilot whale mass beaching. These guys are like dolphins in that they are highly social. They're highly social. They live in groups or pods. And when one gets beached, the others come to help. The others try to help. I don't know much how they can really help, but they can provide their support. But oftentimes, the mass beaching events occur, and um, a lot of the creatures will die. Okay, reason that sounds are produced in marine mammals and some examples. Um, we have male humpback singing. Male humpback singing. What they're doing is they're trying to attract a mate. We also have gray whales and the female gray whales. Female gray whales grunt. And what they're doing is they're calling and encouraging their young. With the pinnipeds, we have the harems and the bachelors. So, and we have fasting and burnout. So, the dominant uh, male seal. So the dominant male protects the harems or his harem from the younger bachelors. And he fasts for long periods of time. So they don't eat and they fight. So they fast and they fight. Eventually they tire out. And then next year, the dominant bachelor takes over. The dominant bachelor is going to take over. Explain and draw the countercurrent heat exchange. This helps to preserve the heat inside many creatures. So here's the artery coming up near the surface and here's the vein and the artery loses the heat to the returning vein because the vein wraps around the artery. So the artery quote loses the heat to the vein so when the artery comes up to the surface, it's already cold. And therefore, it's not going to lose the heat to the outside environment. So artery loses heat to the vein instead of the water. So the surface of their bodies are very cool, like the temperature of the ocean. Reason for whale breaching. This is when they jump out of the water. Why do they do this? Why do they jump out? 
Um, it's believed that it could be fun. They could be removing parasites. And also, they could be using visual cues for migration. So when they come up the coast with their young, um, they'll be spying, coming out of the water and looking around. And perhaps they're teaching their young with visual cues. Ammonia waste, guano waste, urea waste, and why solid waste is needed in egg and where it's stored. Okay, so um, ammonia is a waste product that is produced in every creature. This is in the blood. In uh, fish and in, so urea is produced in fish, which is then just excreted. So the ammonia is converted to urea, and in fish it's just excreted into the water. Um, also, amphibians do the same thing because they live in the water. And um, mammals will also produce urea. However, guano waste is being produced by um, reptiles and birds because they have an egg, solid egg with a shell. So why is it solid waste? It's a solid waste because the embryo would die if it was liquid waste inside that solid shell. So why is it solid waste? Um, so it doesn't kill the embryo. The anoxic layer and oxygen in sand versus clay. So sand has larger air particles. Clay is very tight and compact. So air can penetrate deeply into sand versus it can't penetrate very deeply in the clay. Because of that, um, the anoxic layer is going to be very, very deep. That's the area that doesn't have oxygen. So this will have a deep anoxic layer. Clay and silt will have a very shallow anoxic layer. Compare summer and winter beaches with sand distribution and diversity. So we'll compare the summer here and the winter here. So with the summer, we decrease the wave size and wave energy. So we decrease the waves. We lower the energy on the beach. This builds the beach up. It builds up the beach, and it increases sand. It's the opposite for winter beaches. You increase the waves. You increase the energy. All that sand gets pulled out, forms the sandbars. And so on the beach, it's going to decrease the sand. Pier piling with barnacles, with mussels, and with sea stars. And we'll draw this over here. And we're not going to draw all of them, but there's these typical zones which they will occupy. Sea stars will be at the bottom, mussels, and the barnacles. Okay, what's the upper limit? Why can't these live any higher? And it's due to um, desiccation. Why can't the mussels live any higher? 
their superior competitors, it's due to desiccation. Why can't the sea stars go higher? Again, it's due to desiccation. Why can't the barnacles live in this area? Because they have competition with the mussels and their superior competitors. Why can't the mussels live any lower? It's because the sea stars are going to eat them. We have predation. So we'll say D is, again, desiccation. C is competition. And we'll just say predation. D or P is predation right here. And if you notice that the desiccation, this is the upper limit. The upper limit is due to um, environmental or abiotic factors. The lower limits, what prevents them from li living lower is either competition or predation. These are biological or biotic factors. How sea palms and mussels affect each other. Well, remember the sea palms, these can grow on top of mussels. And then because of the hydrodynamic forces, they can then get ripped away. Cluster rips away. And when it rips away, it leaves a clearing for the postelsia. So the sea palm grows on the rock. Now it's pretty stable there because it's not going to get ripped away because it's not growing on top of the mussels. However, the mussels now grow around the pastelsia and the edges cut into the sea palms and that could send them away. So for extra credit, you can refer to your notes for the Coriolis force. There's going to be another Titanic um, scenario um, involving an iceberg. Is the ship going to crash? What's going to happen? So you have to know your um, northern hemisphere, your southern hemisphere, and um, which direction the Coriolis force is pushing things, 45 degrees to the right, 45 degrees to the left. Um, aspect ratios discussing uh, large um, uh, caudal fins versus smaller ones, comparing their height and also their um, surface area, and the sex changes with some of the fish species that um, will prefer the females in larger numbers compared to the males. So that's it for the review. If you have any questions, please contact me.